me give you just a real quick little uh, story here. So when I first started my career for about three years, I had NIH funding and I would um, create couch potatoes for about a month, mainly of college students. We'd pay them not to do anything. And then we would and eat pizza and do these super carbohydrate diets. And then we would exercise them for a month and then turn them back into couch potatoes again. And we would draw blood. And some of the markers we were looking at is oxidation of LPLA and all these other things, seeing if exercise influenced it. It did change a lot of things, but it did nothing to LPLA. So that's all. I'm done. No, anyway. So, but, uh, but anyway, so I do have some interest and some history with this. And so let me um, just sort of, this will be, I hope, fast and a little bit of fun. How many folks have checked in LPLA in the last year? Wow, okay. It, I was gonna ask how many people have ever checked in LPLA. I'll show you our colleagues here in, in a second. Um, and I guess uh, Dr. Marshall's mainly interested because of aortic stenosis. But we're, we're gonna cover, we're gonna cover the, the guy, with some of the basics, the uh, mass versus concentration, which I think creates more confusion than anything. Guidelines, I was careful because there's really not great guidelines, but more consensus, and then we'll talk about emerging therapies. And you, so we did this uh, study, this was back in 2012, 2011, at Piedmont called the Family Heart Study. So uh, you know it's, it's triggered here, there's more to the story, but I found, I went back and pulled some, a couple patient profiles, and uh, these are two 38-year-old females. And obviously they have a family history, otherwise they wouldn't be in the trial. And, and we would, and both of them were on the fathers, and by definition, they had to have fathers who had infarcts under the age of 45. Now, this is 2012. Now, I, you know, we were, so I said in 2000 I was looking at LPLA, but let, let's just say in America it wasn't commonplace, right? Now, would anybody do any further risk stratification on these two individuals? And, and you'll say, why'd you do a calcium score? on a 38-year-old, and I say, I'll tell you that was part of the trial. But um, anyway, um, you'll notice that the one on the left, my left, she had an LPLA of 190 milligrams per deciliter. Now, this is gonna confuse you because we're gonna jump all around between mass and, I mean, mass and concentration. So let's start off with the basics. LPLA was first discovered by um, a Norwegian physician in the 60s. And it is exclusively made in your liver. You inherit codominantly from your parents the genes to create LPLA. And it starts going up around the age of two and it peaks at about age five. And then it's set for pretty much your entire life. Some things can ch affect it. Um, in 2012, I would have said the same thing I'm gonna say now. It is a risk factor, but it's also a causal agent. And we understand a lot more about that part now. Um, and Carol probably knows a lot more than me. But where I was going to go with this is, you know, it, it has two components that we've known about for a long time. And then it has all these different isoforms. And I'm not going to get into that. But, you know, really it causes plaque and it causes clot. And if you can think about it as simple as that, it is the perfect molecule. Um, so, and, and let me make sure. Oh, sorry. Okay. I'm trying, there's the latch point. So, the... Not to, not to bore you with a lot of cholesterol pictures, but really it is made up of two pieces. One is a ApoB molecule, which is really very similar to LDL cholesterol. And then it has this ApoA moiety attachment. And you'll see right here, this is pl plasminogen right here. This is the first part of this ApoA moiety. And, and the similarities of that with plasminogen are what causes some of the downstream trouble, and we'll, we'll, we'll show some pictures of that in a second. But when we start talking about the different isoforms, the, as we've learned more about LPLA, it has more and more of these little what we call crinkled repeats, and the size and, the, um, and what we're learning about it is, is changed by these different repeats, and I don't want to get into the discussion too deeply on that, but keep it a higher level. So Arthur, um, study this very carefully. I, I'm gonna keep this real simple for you. This is where the balloon goes. But, um, it, it, I, but as we move forward, LPLA is a wonderful signaling molecule. It actually sort of crosses the endothelial barrier and screams for other macrophages and molecules to come to it. And this is one of the things we saw. It, did, it didn't, our, the exercising didn't protect you from its ability to recruit all these other bad actors to start causing the clot that Catherine has to come in at 2 a.m. and fix. 
But at the other part of this, plas it, it, what it does is it has the ability to bind fibrin and inhib inhibits plasminogen's ability to turn into TPA, which lyses clot. So that's where the little crinkle repeat that looks like uh, plasminogen causes the other half of the problem. So it's an incredible oxidizer. It recruits, and then it, it, it helps prevent cause plaque. The other interesting thing about LP LA, and we saw some of this when we looked at it a long time ago, was and this is data out of a consensus paper in case anyone wants it. This was published both in Jack and the journal and by NLA. And you know, and what you'll see is, you know, it's a it's a huge risk factor, genetic risk factor. But one of the things you'll see is that areas of turbulence and and bending of vessels as well as valves is where a lot of the oxidation um, and activity happens. So it's found in very like it, in twists and turns or turbulent conditions. Um, activates it and causes more oxidation of um, LP to LA. And so, you know, obviously there's a lot of interest, especially among this group, about aortic stenosis. So you'll see it there. I'm not going to dive deep into it. There are two papers about, you know, or, well, actually, there are a lot of papers in different isoforms and isotypes that can cause um, aortic stenosis. And the, the real simple take home message is the higher the LP little a value, the, the more progression you have, this, that's uh, velocity, by the way. I'm sorry it doesn't carry forward very well. But the progression of, athletes, the, of aortic stenosis it correlates with the degree or the level of LP little a. Um, so what changes these? Because I don't typically repeat measure these until we have a, a reason to do so with therapies. I will tell you that sometimes they do change. And you can see that renal disease, or it's really nephrotic syndrome, can change it by 60%. They change a little bit in pregnancy. It, it can cause an increase. I'm sorry, it causes an increase. And I did put alcohol consumption, because we are in Napa, can lower LP little a, but you got to drink it chronically to make it happen. And the biggest star is down here is this table really doesn't mean anything clinically. So anyway. <laughs> Um, so here we are, our nice Georgia native. Um, so here's the confusing part, mass versus concentration. Arthur, this is going to be hard for you, so go, we'll go slow. Um, and I think that's one of the most confusing things because we have a different set of numbers and it's created confusion about where does risk start and how do we think about treating it. And, and what we understand is, is with the isoforms, it's really the concentration that matters. And so we've, we've done both. We, in the past, we've measured and reported milligrams per deciliter or nanomoles per liter. And the numbers, obviously, are very different. And finally, we have a WHO standard and recommendation that we really report in terms of concentration. And it's these Kringle repeats that determine that concentration, determine the size. And, and the different isoforms are correlated with different diseases. Um, 50 milligrams per deciliter or 100 nanomoles, so 50 and 100, it's kind of like our LDL goals, you can remember that, is roughly 80% of the U.S., is the sort of the 80th percentile in the U.S. population. Um, you know, the cut points, because of prior standardization of where risk starts, we're actually getting a better handle on now than we did in the past. And um, the ACC AHA 2018 consensus really said, okay, at 125 nanomoles per liter, we should probably elevate risk or, or intensify therapy. So what do the guidelines consensus sort of say? So I'm going to say, uh, this is what I thought in 2012, and we can see if I changed my thought. I, in 2012, the same, same with that patient, I thought it was a causal agent. Uh, you know, <laughs> niacin. I, uh, it, when I was at Vanderbilt and Dr. Marin was my attending, we didn't use a lot of niacin. I came to Emory as a fellow, and we used tons of niacin. So it's interesting how communities are different. Um, I, it, we'll cover that in a second. Um, I would always think about checking it, and folks with family histories, early onset atherosclerosis, especially also with low HDL patients. Uh, so it's the most common inherited pattern with low HDL. Um, and then I always considered cascade screening, and that was in 2012. And um, at that, in the old days, we used to sort of, I'd take the old LDL target and subtract 30 from it. And that was sort of our best, what I, we thought, or what I thought at the time was the best way to um, offset the risk of higher LP LA. So that was 2012, what do we have now? Well, this is this 2019 consensus again. And it looked roughly the same. Obviously, screening uh, in, in, in both people with early disease and also family history and FH patients, uh, ischemic strokes, especially younger individuals with ischemic strokes, um, 
use it to intensify therapy. And I think nowadays, as we become, as we can lower LDL into the 30s and 20s, or and people have repeated events. I often think about, re about ch repeat checking LP little a in those individuals, and luckily the consensus writers believe that as well. And then, you know, interestingly, we're talking more and more about aortic stenosis with LP little a, as you can stain the actual valve and you see LP little a molecules deposited. So this is, I started off with a vote. This is our colleagues here, and this was, uh, ACC 2021 on the website. It was just a survey asking about LPLA. And the reason they did this was because the European Society of Cardiology recommended checking LPLA. And they were wondering about the takeoff in the United States. And about 30% of cardiologists in the United States have never checked an LPLA or wouldn't think about it. And you'll see about 25% had. This, this audience obviously maybe were jaded and biased. Um, you know, and how did people treat it? Well, luckily, not many people use uh, niacin very much. Uh, um, and, you know, statins were the primary go-to. So what about other countries? What do they say? Now, remember, it's genetically inherited. So when you talk about Europe, it's a big area. And, and the genetics within Europe vary greatly. So their, their definition in concentration is 430 nanomoles per liter for being higher risk. Um, but it's a bigger pot. It's a bigger um, mixing or melting pot. The NLA and, um, and um, the Heart UK recommendations really sort of recommend the same thing we have talked about, and they, you know, and suggest screening. Their definitions of higher risk look very much like the United States. This is just the European paper. I'm sensitive to time. So issues today really are that we don't have a defined target to treat. There's no standardization to, of treatment, but uh, exciting stuff on the way. So this is sort of the nuts and bolts. By the way, this, is a, this got presented just about two weeks ago at the European Atherosclerosis, Atherosclerosis Society meeting, and it, I, it actually just reconfirmed about what we were doing in 2000 and 2012 was, was not bad. And r roughly they looked at about 450,000 people, and as as LDL went down and LP little a went up, you would offset the risk roughly by lowering LDL by about 30 points. So in the higher risk individuals, and this is at 250 nanomoles per liter. Um, I just thought that was interesting data that added to what we used to do. So these are the, these are the therapies for LP little a. You can see that the PCSK9 inhibitors lower moderately. Now the offset is moderate reduction and LP to little a probably has no benefit. You really have got to reduce it 80 to 90% to offset the risk if you're just targeting LP to little a. And so that, and, and obviously we, you know, LDLA phoresis, which we used to do a fair amount of occasionally, I mean, back in, in before 2010, um, you can see that in a steady state, it really doesn't lower LP to little a that, that much once it hits a plateau. Now, the new therapies, they're all small inhibitors of mRNA at one point or another, and, and I'm just going to cover them briefly just so you're aware. And new options are, are not going to be that far away. So this is an exciting topic for those of us that enjoy cholesterol um, or creating ex exercising couch potatoes. What I was going to say is, you know, the Horizon trial is going to be completed hopefully by 2024. It's fully enrolled. We participated. Um, once again, it is a Novartis-sponsored trial, and it also is a small messenger inhib uh, RNA inhibitor. Um, Amgen also has a compound that is, is finished phase two, lowers about 90%, and starting phase three, we're a participating site in that. And then finally, this is the, um, I, I believe it's Science Therapeutics, but this got presented at ACC, just another um, phase one, it's very similar injectable subcutaneous um, that shows promise, and, and this is the paper that's associated with it. I have, uh, oh, I went over 38 seconds. All right, um, thank you. That was LP Lille in a summary, in a nutshell, um, in a whirlwind. Was it too fast? <laughs> All right, thank you guys.